So, big round of applause for Lachelle Lazar Leah. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> so, I'm 17 and I'm standing at the side of the road in my lily white hometown dressed in this awesome outfit that I borrowed from my girlfriends and waiting for my first date with Dave, who's a mod and a cross between Paul Weller and David Beckham. It's 7.30 and Dave was supposed to pick me up at seven o'clock, so I'm starting to get a bit anxious. Then around the corner screeches this champagne supernova blasting techno driven by Ian, Dave's drug dealing older brother, who tells me Dave's not coming. Well, I immediately imagine the worst and think, oh my God, Dave must be in the hospital after being hit by a car and falling off his Vespa. But Ian says, no, he's down a pub with his mates. He just sent me to tell you that he's thought about it and he can't go out with you because you're black. And then he adds, but I'll go out with you. I don't mind coloured girls. <laughs> well, I don't go out with Ian. But I do have lots of other white boyfriends, all aspiring hip-hop DJs who are using me as a prop to prove how down they are. <laughs> but that's okay, because I figured out that it's okay to be invisible in an all-white world. But then I go to stay with my father in Trinidad for the first time, and I realize that there, I'm different. I'm now a colored girl in a very multicolored country, and so I don't have to be invisible anymore. And then at the very first party I go to, I meet Neville, who is like a young Idris Elba. And being invisible is the last thing that I want to be. I want Neville to see the real me. And so the next morning, I have the perfect opportunity when he picks me up to take me to Maracas Bay, which is one of Trinidad's best beaches, featuring a 650-foot crescent of golden sand lined with ancient coconut trees. And there's no development, and there's not even a need for a lifeguard, because there's barely anyone there, just a handful of local families gathered on the western end of the bay. So Neville buys us some beers from the only beach bar that's open, and we go and find a secluded spot on the eastern end of the bay, far away from everyone. And everything is just perfect as we talk and get to know each other. And then, after a couple of hours, Neville starts falling asleep. And I'm like, what the... I mean, the first time I'm with a guy that I actually like, and I bore him so much that he takes a nap. But then I realize I've spent so much of my life being invisible at this point that I've forgotten how to be seen. Well, I have to do something about it. And as I'm looking out at the stunning Caribbean Ocean, an idea comes to me. I'm going to do the Ursula Andress beach scene from the 1962 Bond movie, Dr. No. <laughs> now, for those of you who don't know it, Ursula rises from the ocean in this push-up bikini and with a dagger on her hip and humming. And it made her an overnight sex symbol. And I think I'm going to do the same thing. So while Neville's snoozing, I wade out into the crystal water of Maracas Bay and, and I lay back into the water and while I'm building up the courage to, to enact my plan of seduction, I imagine the scene, me rising, dripping wet, and Neville waking to my sweet song, and, and his jaw dropping, and me walking across the sand to him, and then going to kiss him, and him, well, you can imagine. And when I finally straighten up, I realize that I've drifted about 300 feet from the beach. And worse still, I'm still moving out towards the very periphery of the bay and out about to enter open ocean, okay? And I can't call to Neville for help because he's now a little speck on the beach at this point. So then I remember the safety tip, right? If you get caught in a riptide, what you have to do is swim parallel to the beach and try to find a breaking point. So that's what I do. And I swim, and then every 20 feet I try to swim in, and after about 500 feet of this, I'm so weak that I can't even keep my head above water, and I start imagining my own death. <laughs> and I see poor Neville at my funeral weeping over my coffin, and I think, fuck Ursula Andrews and her spray tan. Like, I, I'm so mad at myself for coming up with this ridiculous idea that it gives me this, another boost of energy. 
And so I start swimming towards the beach again, and this time I make it. And as I'm fighting the current, it's like the waves wash all the pain and the anger right out of me, and all that's left is my will to live. And I finally make it to the beach, and I fall face down in the sand, exhausted, but alive. Now, I don't know how long I'm there, but when I wake up, I discover that my hair is just dried in this interesting chia pet hairstyle. <laughs> and I rise to my feet, and I hear a gasp, and immediately I think it's because of my hair, but then I turn around and discover that I landed right in front of an Indian family. The mother covers her eight-year-old son's eyes, and then I discover that I'm completely naked. <laughs> well, I apologize to the family and cover my lady parts, and then I begin the 650-foot walk back down the beach towards Neville. And I can't help laugh at the irony of this, because all I wanted to do was be seen, and now here I am. <laughs> and being seen is the last thing that I want to happen. But the funny thing about almost dying is that it puts things into a new perspective. And suddenly all the racism I suffered in England was trivial, you know. And as I walked towards Neville, he woke up and his jaw dropped, just as I predicted. <laughs> But rather than being embarrassed, I told the story like a conquering hero. And Neville didn't ogle my naked body or think I was an idiot. He got up, wrapped me in the beach towel, made sure I was okay, and then told me he knew what an amazing person I was from the first second we met. So it turns out Neville did see me all along. I just needed to almost drown in order to see myself. Thank you. <laughs>